Of course, this is the celebration of 15 years of In Christ Alone. And uh, yeah, 15 years is quite a long time. I feel like, it, you know, I've written a lot of songs since then. And definitely In Christ Alone was, was kind of setting me on a particular journey. But it's been great, uh, wonderful, really, to see how the song has got into different places, how it's become established, and how helpful, I suppose, it's been. I remember for a number of years being really discontented and really concerned about what was happening in church music and um, certainly in my generation. And I remember one Sunday, I remember the seat I was sitting on in a church in Belfast and I heard a song called How Deep the Father's Love. And I thought, now that is the kind of thing I would love to write. So we got together, we had a coffee, nothing particularly, you know, eventful happened. He said he'd send me a CD with some of his ideas, song ideas. And uh, so he sent it me in the post and it arrived and I kind of put it in, just wasn't expecting anything in particular. And um, the first song, which was just him playing the piano uh, and playing the melody in the right hand. And I, I heard it and I thought, actually, there's something about that. There's something quite profound about it. And Stuart just took it and ran with it and put this just stunning, st stunning, stunning hymn together. So. It was a classic melody. It, since it had that sort of eternal kind of enduring aspect um, and I thought so what could the song be about and I talked to Keith a little bit on the phone subsequent to that and kind of thought actually I, th I think this is a song about Jesus' life, death, resurrection and what that means for us. And I always had a sense that I would love a, a big creedal hymn. I think uh, we, we had a number of things we wanted to see happening in modern church music and the, the, probably three things but the, the most important of the three was hymns that actually help people understand the faith. And so I guess that starts with the gospel story. So I was always excited about a hymn that would do that. And so it kind of popped out of the blue. I wasn't expecting anything particularly, but as I began to write lyrics, it kind of got more and more exciting. I got more and more emotional. Um, uh, you know, I began to kind of just try and put into words what it means for Christ to have gone through what he went through, what that means for me as a person and how that completely changes my life. And uh, so it kind of popped up and, and um, sent the lyrics to, to Keith and uh, he liked them and it kind of just went from there. So we, we changed a couple of things. The first line was originally my hope is found in Christ alone and we switched that round and um, a couple of small little edits but it was, it, it was a stunning lyric and, and, um, and that was the beginning of our career. I'd written the, the lyrics um, and uh, sent them off to, to Keith and Keith made some comments which were really helpful. One of the comments he made which I think shows his sensibility as far as lyric writing, even though he's known as a melody writer, his sensibility as a, as a lyric writer was that the first line originally said, um, my hope is found in Christ alone. And he said, it would be really good if the song began with the phrase in Christ alone. And um, I was kind of slightly against it because I had this rhyming scheme going on in the verse and didn't want to mess it up. So I was slightly irritated by his, his request. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, actually, yeah, that, that probably would be stronger. So I moved it around so the song starts with In Christ Alone. I actually think it was a stroke of genius because now the song is known as In Christ Alone. It's where the song begins. It's the statement you make. It's the first thing you sing. And actually, I think it makes the overall impact really a lot stronger. I think Stuart's lyric is so wonderful at spelling out our identity and who we are in Christ. Um, but, but starting with Christ, but I think as well, in terms of going in a more hymn-like direction, um, it's been amazing to see how actually a hymn can actually go much broader into the church than a contemporary song. When I first started talking to people who were trying to write modern hymns for churches in the year 2000, no one would listen. Almost no one, I should say, would listen. 
And um, yet that song was the, was, the, was the thing that kicked open the door for us to write a catalogue of songs that teach the Bible to churches around the world today. So, so I think from that point of view, that was the most significant thing for our work. So, um, you know, you might find with something like In Christ Alone, you know, on any given Sunday, it might be being played by the local worship band in a, you know, in a lively fellowship somewhere. But, you know, a little way along the road in a cathedral somewhere, it's being played on an organ and a choir is singing it. It has that sort of spread. And that was something that actually, having written In Christ Alone and beginning to write more hymn-like things, actually was very exciting to be able to take a message that would go out and actually feed churches across the spectrum, not just in one particular denomination or stream. And that's been really rewarding. And it kind of, the songs somehow draw the church together, which I, I'm really excited about and I think is really pleasing to God and honouring to God to see the church coming together in that way. Christ Alone has definitely produced more feedback in terms of people writing, emailing, or me talking to people at the end of concerts or worship events uh, than all the other songs I've written put together. There is something that has happened with that song. And um, it, it genuinely, I know people always say it's very humbling, but it really is very humbling uh, to hear some of the, the stories that people um, tell me about, write about, or talk about um, face to face. Um, you know, uh, there is something I think that encapsulate, partic encapsulates particularly in perhaps times of crisis in people's lives. It's, it's something that gives them a sense of hope and solidity that is in the gospel message that actually we somehow managed to get somewhere, you know, actually managed to say somehow in the song. It's, it's hearing congregations sing it. It's hearing a congregation of 90 people with sort of an incompetent keyboard player, and yet people just loving singing it. I think that's, that's, that's when you step back as somebody who writes for the church, you realize as a Christian, you know, give up your small ambitions of, 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 of writing number one, you know, chart hits, and write for God's people, because that kingdom um, is far greater than any kingdom you could build on earth. I sometimes hear, um people in churches, particularly leaders, quite often saying what's really important about worship songs is what the words say and that that's the, that's the key. You know, we choose songs based on, you know, what is being expressed. And I, and, and I understand that and I agree with that to some extent. But sometimes it kind of comes over as, you know, the, the melody is just a, uh, uh, you know, as long as the melody is easy to sing and stuff, it doesn't really matter about the melody. What matters is the words. I actually don't think that's the case with songs. And I don't think that's the case within Christ alone. It's worth noting that actually the lyrics only came about as a result of the melody. I don't think in any art form you can separate out the, 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 the art forms like two, like two separate chemicals, for example. Um, um, I think, I've, um, as, as Stuart, Stuart always says, the music informs a lyric. Um, but I think, I think both, are, both are so curiously important. I found when I listened to that melody that Keith had written, it had an impact on me. The melody already said something and it was my job to find out and to fill in and to articulate what that melody was hinting at, what it was saying. So one without the other is, is, is useless. I do think there's a bigger responsibility on leaders, whether it's pastors and musicians and worship leaders to ensure that the lyrics are helpful, but I, I, I've never looked at it like a corrective. I've looked at it like let's let's create let's let's fill people up with the big picture of God, with the life-saving good news of Jesus' gospel. You know that's what we're trying to do. Then we want to fill people's minds and hearts and emotions. So I feel very much that melody and lyrics are equally powerful in terms of taking us on a journey, both in terms of expressing what our faith is and what our response to that statement of faith is. So I think the two go together and melody writers are just as valuable in the kingdom of God as lyric writers.
I think this song is about the life, death, resurrection of Christ and what difference that makes to every single person on the planet. And I think that is at the core of the song. That's the journey that we're hoping people go on when they sing this song.